engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. To- <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery, is advances, advances, questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist. This is the show that brings you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. I'm Chris Smith and coming up this week, sweltering temperatures wreak havoc across Europe and North America. What needs to be done though to bring them down? We hear from the Cambridge scientist who wants to create the largest ever DNA and health research programme for children and young people. And did aliens crash land on Mars? Strange pictures resembling a crash site have been circulating. But could there be a more mundane explanation? Up first this week, southern European countries usually experience high temperatures in July and August. That's, after all, the reason they attract so many of us as holidaymakers. But this year, those temperatures have gone far beyond their previous limits, and now wildfires are causing havoc in parts of Greece and Italy. Experts say the latest searing heatwaves would have been virtually impossible without climate change. The UK's Met Office has also warned that record-breaking temperatures will soon become the norm. Sir Bob Watson is a physical chemist specialising in environmental science and he's a leading authority on the science of climate change. What are the odds, I asked him, that what we're seeing this summer is anything other than down to man-made climate change? It would be very, very unlikely to occur without human-induced climate change. It's not only the heat waves in Europe, but in China, in the southwest of the United States. And the scientists that are looking at these issues do state categorically that without human-induced climate change, we would not be seeing these extreme events. And indeed, it's not just heat waves. We're seeing more floods. We're seeing more droughts. uh, We're drying our land, which leads to more forest fires. So yes, human-induced climate change is certainly linked uh, to these phenomena. So it's the pattern that is telling here because of course we've always had record-breaking temperatures in the past haven't we? we've had one-offs but it's it's the consistency and the geographical pattern yeah i mean what we're seeing this year is not only these heat waves in fact what we've seen is the hottest day globally average ever we've now seen the hottest june ever we've seen the atlantic ocean being warmer than ever for this time of year And we've seen record low amounts of Antarctic sea ice. We've seen all of the patterns that we would expect with human-induced climate change. We've always stated that a change caused by humans would lead to more extreme events. And this is what we're seeing. And in the near term, what do you think is in store for the tourist industry? Are we going to see more of this? And and should people effectively plan that those sorts of summer holidays might in future be off limits? It's not just the summer. In the winter, we're seeing the snow falling later and melting earlier. So the ski resorts in Europe, North America, are also threatened by human-induced climate change. But you're right. If we start to see as a new normal these high temperatures in June, July, it would make people want to have their vacations more in the spring and in the fall. But of course, children's school holidays are in the middle of summer. Maybe that has to change in the future. People often liken the climate to an oil tanker steaming along at sea, as in there's enormous momentum in the system. So even if you you stop the tanker's engines, it's going to roll on for quite some distance before it comes to a halt. So how much worse, then, is this going to get, even if we we go as planned and and we do aggressively cut down carbon emissions? Well, the problem is that the governments that signed the so-called Paris Climate Agreement to try and limit human-induced climate change to no more than 2 degrees Celsius and preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius, the pledges these governments have made are not putting us on a pathway to 1.5 or 2. They're putting us on a pathway for the world to warm 2.5 to possibly 3 degrees Celsius. If we want to be on a pathway of 1.5 to 2, we need global emissions to be 50% lower by 2030 
than they were in 2020. And the trouble is, the emissions are going up still. They're not going down. Do you think that to an extent there's a messaging problem? Because when we say things like one and a half degrees or two and a half degrees, that doesn't sound like very much. I mean, that's obviously a, a global average. So in global terms, it's huge because there are going to be extremes at each end to reach that average. But do you think we should start telling people, look at what's happening in places like Southern Europe at the moment, and that would focus their minds a bit more? Oh, I, I think we have to incre- improve our messaging. What we should tell people is it globally averaged, we've only warmed about 1.2 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial. And look what we're seeing. If we go to two degrees, let alone three degrees, we're going to see even more of these three extreme weather. We'll see sea level rise causing coastal erosion, people being moved from their homes. So I do think we have to relate what does 1.5 or 2 or 2.5 really mean? One problem, though, is that with cutting carbon comes a cost to be paid. And many people in the UK are struggling to pay their bills at the moment and they're being told to install heat pumps costing enormous amounts of money. They're being told they won't be able to buy a gas boiler from a certain date. They're being told they'll have to invest in an electric new car rather than a a petrol and diesel one. The UK's contribution to global emissions is about 1% and many other countries totally eclipse our contributions. So I don't want to use a rude expression, but are we urinating into the wind? All countries have to cut their emissions, especially countries that have had high emissions in the past, which are the developed industrialised countries of North America, Europe, Russia, etc. We all have to do our part. And there's no question there will be some short term costs. But to be honest, in the long term, it will cost all of us less money to avoid climate change than to adapt to climate change. So we do need to make these changes, but government has to work with the public to try and make these changes as painless as possible. The point I was making, though, is that we could bend over backwards in this country and and have no carbon emissions at all by working very hard at it, and we would make such a slim dent if everyone else continues the way they're going that really it would be not worth doing it. Absolutely correct. We're all in this together. That's why the Paris Agreement was such an important agreement and that every country in the world literally said, we will try and achieve these targets. But we need the big emitters, China, the United States, India. The UK alone, zero in its emissions, will make very little difference. So there must be an international agreement where we all work together. We're basically all in the same lifeboat. We'll either all sink together or we'll swim together. So Bob Watson there. Researchers at Cambridge University are helping to create the biggest health initiative of its kind in this country and in a world first for children and young people to link our DNA code and the environment we grow up in with disease risks and health outcomes. And Anna Moore is the clinical lead on the study. She's with us. What is it you are doing, Anna, and what are you hoping to achieve? We've got this fantastic opportunity to tackle some of the most pressing health challenges that are facing the NHS, and that's by carrying out kind of pioneering, groundbreaking research, um, which is going to help us to understand the origins of disease, but also to develop new treatments for children, but also for adults throughout the life course, so even on to older age. So one of the things that I find most fascinating about this is that if we look at um, the origins of disease, we, the, most of the diseases that we all suffer from start in the first 20 years of life. And yet if we look at the research that's done, it's all predominantly done in adults. And because of this, we're, massing, we're missing this huge opportunity to um, really tackle some of the challenges, develop new treatments and solve some of the problems that are facing us all, but in particular our children. Can you tell us about the nuts and bolts of the study? What are you actually doing and with whom? Well, it's with the NIHR Bioresource and it's called the DNA Children and Young People's Health Resource or Decipher. And what we're doing is we're encouraging children from 0 to 15 
to get involved, to become um, heroes for healthcare research. Um, so we're asking them to join Decipher, um, to spit into a tube and to answer some questionnaires and then um, start to become this, this community of young people who are going to really help us transform health by developing this understanding of the origins of disease and developing these new treatments. So this is a follow-up study in the sense by getting them to spit you get their DNA code I presume and mm-hmm. then by, yep. by joining your community you can watch what happens to them and presumably you'll know something about their lifestyle, their environment and so on so you mm-hmm. can begin to unite what happens to them with that DNA code. Exactly. And also the other thing that's really critical about Bioresource is it's a research resource that can enable new studies. So rather than just being a biobank, which they're incredibly valuable, fantastic data, this, these are people who are joining who want to contribute to health research. So um, by joining, they're saying that they're willing to be contacted up to three times a year um, to get involved in ethically approved health research that can really help us transform um, those that, that the kind of speed at which we're able to answer some of these questions. And young people can, you know, they can get involved in as many of those studies as they want to or they can decide that, that, that none of them are for them. That's absolutely fine. What are the big challenges when it comes to children and young people's health that you're hoping to get at with this, that we can't get at with? Because there are rival biobank studies that, as you pointed out earlier, have looked mm. at adults and united adults' health outcomes mm. with their DNA and so on. So what are you going for with this specifically? There's a couple of opportunities, really. So one is to intervene early to identify problems early. So if we can understand the relationship between environment, genetics and our health, then we've got this first opportunity to really be able to to spot diseases quickly, diagnose early, possibly to prevent, but to create treatments where, you know, that are able to have an impact in the very early years. And we're hoping or we expect that that will have a really significant impact on long-term health conditions. So and this is really important at the moment. So um, there was a health um, report that was published by the Health Foundation just this week that showed um, that, you know, we've got this real race against time at the moment. So two and a half million extra people are going to have long-term illnesses by 2040. But on top of that, if we also look at the health of children in the UK, Um, compared to those in Europe, but they're much, much worse. So, you know, we really need to take the opportunity that we have presenting us now to tackle some of these issues, not only for the individuals involved, but also so that we can tackle some of the challenges of the NHS um, of the future. So it's really important. Often, though, many diseases don't manifest until we're old, but the seeds are Mm. sown in our youth. Are you not going to have to wait a really long time? (laughs) Well, As in, you and me might well be taking our pension, hopefully, by the time some of these things manifest. So is this a long-term viewpoint you're taking here? There's going to be different elements of it. So there are going to be elements where we are looking at what happens over time, but there's going to be the opportunity to develop treatments like really early. So the whole genetic commitment. So one of the things is, uh, that I think about is type 1 diabetes. Diagnosed in childhood, from day one, um, children and young people you know, have to have multiple injections a day. It's miserable for them, it's miserable for their families. But now we've discovered that there's a subtype of type 1 diabetes that is particular to children and older people who have a particular genetic subtype and actually now they can have a treatment which is a tablet which is transformative for them so this isn't just about understanding what happens later it's also about developing personalized treatments which we can give to people early in order to like you know have better long-term outcomes so it is about the long term but it's very much about developing personalized preventative treatments for earlier in the disease course as well. Anna Moore there. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. This is The Naked Scientists. I'm Chris Smith. Still to come, did an alien spaceship cause the pointy protrusions that have turned up on the surface of Mars? Or is there some other logical explanation? Before that, though, health officials in Australia say they have virtually eliminated HIV transmission in parts of inner-city Sydney that were once the centre of the AIDS epidemic in the country. It follows the announcement that new infections among gay men in that part of Sydney are down by 88% since 2010. Professor Sharon Lewin, an infectious diseases expert and also president of the International AIDS Society, has been telling us about the significance of the new data. This is pretty remarkable. 
and it is approaching the targets of how HIV elimination or elimination of transmission is defined, which means a drop in 90% of infections. This is an area where there is a very large number of gay men who are actively involved and engaged in health promotion who have high uptake of antiretroviral therapy in people who are infected with HIV and that makes them non-infectious and also high uptake of HIV prevention measures, significantly PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is taking antiviral tablets to prevent you becoming infected. So could other parts of Australia benefit from the great work that's been going on in inner city Sydney? Sharon Lewin again. Well, this is one small part of Australia, but a very significant part because that was the epicentre of the HIV epidemic where we saw the largest deaths in the early 80s. It tells us that these interventions work when you use them properly and when you have community engagement and community-led education. So other parts of Sydney and then other cities across Australia are doing all of these interventions, but I guess it's inspiring and it gives people hope that this you can reach these sorts of numbers with a concerted effort. And, of course, in Australia, there has been a number of factors that have led to a very good HIV response, including bipartisan political support for the HIV response since the early 80s, universal health coverage, partnership models of working between government scientists and the community. And so I think it does tell us that if you have these ingredients you apply the interventions in the way that we've seen in inner city Sydney, we really could get to a elimination of HIV transmission. That, of course, doesn't mean we've eliminated HIV because there are still in Australia 28,000 people living with HIV, but we've stopped new infections, which is a very significant milestone. And regular listeners will know that it's been 40 years since HIV was first identified. And we've been reporting just how far the treatment has come since the 1980s. And as part of a brand new series that we're bringing out soon, we'll also be hearing from the former head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States, who also played a massive role in America's response to HIV. That was Dr Anthony Fauci. We went from a disease with an almost uniform fatality to a disease now where you can give a combination of drugs sometimes in a single pill once a day that can bring the level of virus to below detectable level and keep it there and allow persons with HIV with few exceptions now to lead almost the normal lifespan like maybe a year or two less than what would one considered the normal life expectancy that is a major major accomplishment, which over a period of decades went from despair about no interventions that were of use to a couple of decades later to be able to have transformed the lives of persons with HIV. Anthony Fauci, and you can hear more from him next month when we launch a brand new podcast series, which we're calling Titans of Science. And also on the billing for that programme are our former chief medical officer, that's Dame Sally Davies, the fertility expert, Lord Robert Winston, and the first Briton in space, Helen Sharman. Now, talking of space, earlier this week, the mainstream media reported the possibility that an alien spaceship crash could have accounted for some strange tracks and pointed structures that were spotted recently on the surface of Mars. Such a scenario, say researchers, cannot be discounted with absolute certainty, particularly as fragments including what could be wheels, an axle and a crater debris field have been photographed at another Gale crater location. So is this ET or just down to something more mundane like seismic activity? Well with us now is Dr David Whitehouse who's a space scientist and also author of The Alien Perspective, A New View of Humanity and the Cosmos. David, first can you explain and describe for us what these pictures and structures that have been circulating, what they look like? Well they come from the Curiosity rover which has been exploring Gale Crater now for over three and a half thousand uh, Martian days. And uh, it's taken a lot of pictures, made a lot of measurements, taken a lot of analysis. Uh, And these pictures are, they draw the eye because they are remarkable structures in the sense that uh, you see um, half buried in the the Martian sand, you see uh, a a series of a a dozen or so spikes, which reminds some people of vertebrae. 
of a, a, de of a skeleton half buried in the sand. You see others where you see regular patterns across the sand, uh, other rocks uh, tilted in various directions. Um, you can, with the eye of faith, see something that you might consider to be some sort of structure in there, something that doesn't look quite uh, natural. And this has happened particularly at the, the one location with the spikes. But there is a cottage industry, I think, of enthusiasts who look at every picture sent back from Mars, not only from Curiosity rover, uh, but from Perseverance rover and from the satellites going around Mars, looking for something that is strange in the hope of finding, you know, the big discovery of aliens or ancient <laughs> aliens. I think we've seen doorways, we've had faces reported in the past, haven't we? Is there a oh, rational explanation yes. for this? So when, when we're thinking about oh. what could explain why they're seeing these pictures, this could be a crashed alien spacecraft, it could be a dead alien dinosaur, but what else could it be? Well, yes, you're quite right. Nobody can say for certain that, it's, that uh, an alien spacecraft couldn't have crashed on Mars. Nobody could say... It's impossible that an alien spaceship could arrive in Earth orbit tomorrow. It is not It is possible. question is, what is the evidence? And the evidence of these rocks are is that they are just rocks that have been on the surface of Mars for billions of years. They were, uh, some of them laid down in, in when Gar Crater was a, a shallow shallow sea. Um, you have um, erode when they were exposed and the water and the, disappeared from, from Mars as Mars dried out. Uh, uh, so for billions of years, these rocks have been uh, exposed to sand blasting and uh, erosion. And these have sought out the weaknesses in the rocks. These spikes, they look like regions where deposition occurred of slightly stronger rocks that are related perhaps to seasonal weather or climatic cycles on Mars. And the softer rock has been weathered away, leaving the harder spikes in between. And you can see that in the rocks behind it. How big are these structures? Just to give people an idea, when you say the sort of spikes and things sticking out, how big? The, the spikes are six or seven inches long, and they are remarkable. I go and look at them, they are remarkable, but they are natural. And the US Senate this week have been having some hearings, haven't they, on, on UFOs and things. There's all the usual uh, conspiracy theories coming out of that. Have, have you watched any of that? Mm -hmm. And did they talk about Oh, yeah, this? I watched it. It was great. It was great theatre. Um, and there are, particularly David Grush there, is an ex-intelligence officer who claims to have been told that the United States has 121 crashed alien spacecraft and actually has um, alien bodies, which they have studied. And they've kept this secret for 80 years or so. Way back to the 1930s, they had alien uh, spacecraft. But to be honest, we've heard all this before. And what was yesterday was in front of Congress, so they were under oath and they were testifying. We heard the same story we've heard before. And generally, I would classify this as the Americans say yesterday's event as a great big nothing burger, because it's all very well to have stories we all love stories, but there comes a time when you have to have evidence. And there's always a soft shoe shuffle with aliens and UFOs that the evidence never quite comes. It's somewhere else. It's classified. It's been covered up. There's a conspiracy. What yesterday showed is that we've reached a stage where stories aren't enough. We need the picture. Somebody says they've seen the picture. Well, for heaven's sake, show it us. All intriguing stuff. David Whitehouse there, author of The Alien Perspective. And now it's time for Question of the Week, and it's over to James Titko to take it on. Hello and welcome to Question of the Week. I'm James Titko. This week, Frank writes in to ask, have there been any studies on the effects of rocket launches on the greenhouse effect or respiratory issues and general carcinogenic properties? And it's an interesting conundrum, Frank. How does funding for space exploration, which might well hold the solution to many of our problems, account for costs which may be inflicted on the environment? Well, to help me shed some light, I've enlisted Zander Byrne from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Astronomy. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, Frank's question raises a few quite interesting points. So rocket launches do have an impact on the greenhouse effect but not actually because of the greenhouse gases that they emit. So a lot of rockets use kerosene as their fuel, and uh, that releases CO2 when it's burned. Uh, but kerosene is also jet fuel, right? 
and you know whereas in a given week there might be like three or four rocket launches there will also be something like 800,000 flights so you know in that context rocket launches aren't really much of a problem the difference is that in a rocket launch the fuel has to be burned through so quickly that we have uh, what's called incomplete combustion the fuel doesn't sort of burn all the way and you just basically end up with a load of soot particulate carbon being released out into the upper atmosphere. You might not know that soot is actually the second biggest contributor to global warming after greenhouse gases. So although some rocket companies will say that the emissions of their rocket launches are much lower than commercial flights, the amount of soot they produce is really starting to have an effect, especially since it's partly being released way up in the stratosphere where it tends to stick around for a long time, interfering with the ozone layer and so on. And the problems don't stop there. There's another fuel which is quite often used in rocket launches called unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, or UDMH. And this is really, really horrible stuff. It's incredibly carcinogenic and really, really bad for you. But it doesn't actually need an ignition system to set it off. So it's really easy to build a rocket which uses UDMH as a fuel. But just like kerosene, it usually doesn't burn completely. So when the first stages of a rocket are finished and fall back to Earth, they contain quite a lot of unburned UDMH, which just gets spilled out into soil and rivers and the general environment. In Kazakhstan, where a lot of Russian rockets launch from, they found very high rates of cancer in towns hundreds of miles away from the launch sites. So rockets which use this fuel are really bad for the people living even remotely nearby. But space exploration continues nevertheless. The potential upside is huge after all. Humanity's innate urge to push the boundaries, to go where we haven't before, has served us fairly well to this point. That's something that a lot of astronauts remark about when they see the Earth from space for the first time, is just how fragile our planet is. And perspectives like this are really valuable to motivate us to want to protect our planet and to see it for the beautiful place that it is. Thanks for sending that one in, Frank. If you'd like to have us try and answer one of your questions, please send it to chris at nakedscientists.com. And that's what we have time for this week, but do tune in on Tuesday when we'll be asking whether hydrogen could be the answer to all of our energy needs. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It's supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith. Thank you for listening. And until next time, goodbye.